I want to start off and thank Jared and everyone else who has been organizing this great conference. I came as a participant, or a, just a viewer last year, and it was great. Um, and I came back and wanted to talk this year. So I'm going to be talking about a project that I worked on this summer with an organization called Data Science for Social Good. And we developed a model that would predict uh, police officers who are at risk of having an adverse interaction with the public, which, as you can imagine, is an incredibly hot topic now. So first and foremost, I want to say that uh, I did not do all of this work alone. I worked on a team of four. We worked with the Nashville Police Department. We also worked in conjunction with a team of three that was working on the Charlotte Police Department, or working with the Charlotte Police Department. We also had uh, two technical mentors, Joe Walsh, Jen Helsby, and a project manager, Allison Weil. So I am indebted to all of these people for great uh, hard work in the summer. And without them, this would not have gone anywhere. So first and foremost, adverse incidents with the police are tragic. Um, we all know incidents like these. We really struggled when we were trying to set up this slide. You know, Could we put faces on here or a list of names? And the truth is, there are just too many people who have been killed um, in these types of incidents to even put on a slide like this. But also, we're talking about more than just people who are killed. Because an adverse incident can range from someone dying or to a police officer using force inappropriately. And that might not actually be documented anywhere, but it still impacts people's lives. So let's put some numbers on it. Um, in 2011, um, and these are statistics from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, about 63 million people had contact with the police. A little, around half of these were involuntary contacts. They weren't situations where someone called the police and said, I want you to come out and do something for me, but rather police approached somebody um, and they had that contact. About three million of those people claim that they felt the police didn't behave properly. Something went wrong. Of those, 120,000 filed reports. And of those 120,000 reports, less than 10,000 were sustained. So when we're looking at this as a machine learning problem, we can see this is a tiny, tiny minority of truly labeled data, these sustained reports, in a vast sea of events that happened. Additionally, we know that these labels are not actually the only incidents, right? So this little red square it is dwarfed by that orange square where people say they felt like the police behaved inappropriately. And so we want to expand that out. Um, but we also don't want to take just every accusation as like, that definitely happened, because we know that that's not the case. Um, and so this is a complicated problem. So we worked with the Metro Nashville Police Department and the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. These are both cities that are mid-sized in the United States. Both of these police departments are uh, medium-sized as well. They're both fairly progressive in trying to get new techniques for a system like this. Uh, many police departments have uh, threshold-based indicator systems, and they're really simple. It'll say things like, if you used force four times in the past week, then we flag you as being at risk, um, and we'll do something about that, maybe. Um, and I'll show you at the end of the talk what that might look like in practice, especially compared to a system that we developed. So in the Metro, for the Nashville Police Department, uh, there are about 1,200 police officers. And in the five years from 2011 to 2016, which is when we had data, there are 430,000 arrests, 2 million traffic stops, 2 million dispatches. Uh, for the Charlotte Police Department, we had slightly more officers. We had 1,800. And again, in that same five-year period, there were fewer arrests, 120,000, 680 traffic stops, and 9 million dispatches. So we're looking at a, a decent chunk of data and a decent chunk of kind of police activity. Now, looking back at these uh, reports that were made by citizens, um, in Nashville, there are 533 unique officers who had some sort of complaint about them. And these are across 4,500 complaints. And of those, 1,200 were sustained. Um, in Charlotte, the number of complaints is lower, but the number of officers is higher. And the ratio of sustained to unsustained complaints is also higher. Um, we took this as a good sign for our data that the uh, rate of sustaining a complaint like this is actually fairly high. Um, I don't know what it is in New York, but in Chicago, the rate of this uh, complaint to sustain is around 3%. Um, and so this is a sign that the, these, both of these departments treat this process seriously, um, and the, the, the complaints aren't just kind of thrown away or not investigated. 
So what are our general goals? First, we want to predict officers who are at risk of adverse incidents in order to prevent them. And overall, what this does is it allows us to facilitate intervention with the police officers, build and maintain public trust between the police officers and the communities that they serve, and meet growing national standards. Additionally, these two police departments want to set set an example for other departments. Um, this is really cutting edge work in the police world, and they've, there's actually been quite a bit of coverage in uh, like Police Chief Magazine for this project. And so we're hoping that it will spread. Um, and finally, somewhat self-servingly, just to stay out of the news. Um, no police department wants to be written up in the news because there is an incident like this. So what are we trying to predict? Um, we constrain our problem to predicting officers who will have an adverse incident over the next year. Um, and this seems like a fairly broad time window, but the types of interventions that were possible are things that will take time. And so we didn't want to narrow it down to a week or a month because it might take that long to schedule a training for, say, tactics concerns or something like that. So what is an adverse incident? The way that we defined it for this model was it was any complaint from a citizen or a colleague that was sustained, and this included internal disciplinary processes. Any use of force or another type of tactic like a pursuit that was deemed through uh, an investigation to be improper. And finally, some accidents and injuries that were deemed to be preventable. So this is like a car wreck and a chase that was due to an officer driving poorly. So we had a bunch of data from both police departments. Um, we had data generally in three categories. We had category, uh, information about the officers themselves, so things like age, gender, marriage events, like getting married, getting divorced, and some of their academy records. We also had information from the department itself, so things like incident reports and internal affairs, so things like how many arrests did someone make, um, how many times have they had allegations lodged against them, how many times have they violated a rule. And finally, we had information just kind of about the general functioning of the police department, so how many hours an officer worked in a shift, what types of shifts there were, how many sick days they took, et cetera. So we have all of this data, um, and it basically just came in a bunch of flat files. We had Department A, Nashville, Department B, uh, Charlotte. We said, OK, we need to do something with this. So first, we took these and put them into a Postgres database, which we called our staging database. It was just basically a replication of the flat files. It was easy to query. And then we uh, sat down and said, OK, we have these two different departments, and we don't want to make the same model twice, um, especially because we want this to be something that can expand out nationwide, ideally. Um, so we can't just say, oh, it's bespoke for every single department. We have a specific database. You have these columns, and we make a model from there. So we developed what we called the common police schema. Um, and as I was practicing this talk yesterday, Frederica asked me to talk about this a little bit more, because here I have two small arrows and another database symbol with some stars on it. And I was like, yep, nope, done, OK, great, we can move on. Um, this was a huge amount of work. And it actually ended up paying off at the end incredibly for us. But uh, we spent hours sitting on these arrows thinking, OK, we have this code violation. Let's go look at the two different policy manuals for Nashville and the one policy manual from Charlotte and figure out what category that that actual rule violation was. Was it a use of force? Was it uh, an improper pursuit? Um, and doing that at the beginning and creating that architecture allowed us to develop a model that would work for both police departments, regardless of where the data came from. And ideally, when we get our next department, it'll just go right in and be totally fine. So from this, we can then generate a bunch of features. These were generally. Uh, those officer characteristics, which were fairly static. And we also did look back windows. So we'd say, how many arrests did you make in the last week? How many uh, car chases were you in in the last week, last year, et cetera? We put those into a machine learning model. The machine learning model did things that were fancy. And then we got a list of officers ranked by their risk scores. So for this, we used temporal cross-validation. Um, we had data over five years, and so we would establish a fake today, which is basically like, today is the day that we're going to stop taking information from our model. We'll look at everything in the past, and then try and make predictions going forward for a year. So we had our training data, which is where we estimated the parameters of all of these different models. And then we used the test data to tune the model. Um, so the test data was in the next year, and the labels including that, as well as all of the features. So we pick our hyperparameters for the models from that. And then finally, we use the holdout set to see how accurate our model actually is. And we did this iteratively as well, um, but this is just a general breakdown of that. So the types of models we used were fairly standard machine learning models. The ones that were the most successful were uh, tree-based models. 
And I'll describe uh, in a few minutes the, the features that kind of came to the top here. But so let's look at what this looks like in practice. So here is a plot that shows the risk scores for every officer for the Nashville Police Department over time coming out of one of our models. So the x-axis is time. Uh, each line represents an officer. If they're at the top of the plot, they're at high risk. If the bottom of the plot, they're at low risk. And so you can see there's a great variation among officers. Many of the officers are very low because many officers are at very low risk of having an adverse incident. But there are some officers that are really high. So we can pull a single officer out of this and say, OK, what do they look like over time? And we can see there's actually quite a bit of variation over time. So this is for Officer 1204 in our database, which is anonymized. That's not his real name. <laughs> so let's dig into this officer uh, a little bit more. So for this plot, I've broken down a number of different uh, features of his activity over time. So at the top, we have arrests. Each bar here represents, er, is a month. And then the height represents how many arrests were made in that month. And so you can get a general idea of, of how active they were making arrests over time. Then we have incidents. Here, the yellow dots are, represent complaints that were lodged but not sustained when they were investigated. The purple dots represent uses of force. The red dots represent complaints that were sustained. Uh, yes, and that's it for here. Oh, sorry, no, the blue is internal discipline processes. So something like if a supervisor said, you did this wrong, but there was no actual complaint from a citizen. And so we can see there are a number of these over time. We have our risk score as it was given every month. Um, and then finally down here, we have the types of shifts that this officer did. So in the beginning, they were working patrol. And then uh, at, towards the end of 2011, they started doing traffic duty. And so here we can see that this officer had a number of complaints, some of which were sustained. Their risk score started out fairly low. But then once we saw the sustained, it went up. And that's something that comes up over and over in our models. Police officers who have these types of events in the past are likely to have them in the future. And so in an imaginary world when we were in 2014, he would, if, and we, were, we had implemented this system, we would have flagged this officer as being at high risk of having an adverse incident going forward. If you look at the next year, we see that there are actually a number of these adverse incidents. So this is a, a place where our model did right. We flagged the officer. And ideally, if this were working, there would be some sort of intervention, training, counseling, and we could hopefully prevent these incidents from happening. Moving on to a different officer, um, this officer has much less activity. They're, the maximum number of arrests they have in any given month is 21. They only have two complaints against them, neither of which were sustained. And we can see they have a very low um, risk score overall. So again, if we pretend that we're on January 1st, 2014, they have a low risk score. We flag them as not at high risk. And the model, again, got this one right. There were no ad adverse interactions that happened after this. Then we had this officer. And this officer was a little bit strange. And we actually came here because it was one of our uh, false negatives. Um, but then once we plotted this, we realized what was going on. And this was confirmed when we talked to our project partners. So they have a tiny number of arrests. They at most have three. Then there are two months where they have two. And there was one month where they have one. Um, they only have a, a one complaint that was not sustained, and then one internal discipline process. And our model picked up on this. And so if we are at January 1st, 2014, we would have flagged them as an officer that was not at risk of having an adverse interaction. But in the next year, there was a complaint that was sustained. Uh, when we talked to our partner, um, so this is an example where our model got this one wrong. Um, but when we talked to our partner, we realized that this is one of these areas where we're just not looking at the right types of data for this officer. They were a school resource officer, so their arrests are very low, which makes a lot of sense. You don't arrest that many people in schools. Um, but they said that uh, this is someone that they would like to flag um, because of that particular incident was definitely something they wish they could have caught earlier. And they, uh, their supervisor felt like there were things in the past that might, we might have been able to add to the model. Um, so there's definitely room for growth. Then we have this officer. Um, again, this officer has a fairly high score overall. There are a number of different incidents. If we, uh, this time we're going to zoom a little bit forward and do the end of 2015, we would have flagged this officer at being at high risk of having an adverse incident. But after 2015, there's actually no incidents that happen. So this is an example where our model got flagged an officer, but it wasn't right. And at first, we were really surprised by this, but we when we were talking with our partner, they said, oh, no, this makes sense. This, this officer was actually pretty risky. Um, and then we realized that the rest just dropped to zero for like six months. 
Um, and our partner said, yeah, what probably happened here was some internal process that in the division that didn't actually get percolated into our data. Um, and so this officer was likely intervened on just without a system because his supervisor recognizes something was up. Um, and so this is another struggle we had with our data is that we're working with a system that is constantly moving and people are constantly monitoring it. And sometimes we don't get that this officer was intervened on. OK, the screen is flashing at me. Um, so the important features that we had were uh, dispatches, especially recent dispatches, um, as well as the types of dispatches that they saw. So if an officer was recently dispatched to a large number of very uh, stressful situations, like a suicide call or a domestic violence, that led to an increased risk of having an adverse incident. Additionally, number of arrests and number of traffic stops, especially recently, uh, was highly correlated with having an adverse incident. Hours per shift, so officers that worked longer were at a higher risk. Um, demographic information about where the officers were patrolling tended to be correlated. And finally, extreme variability in activity over time was correlated with having uh, an increased risk. So that officer that had only three arrests, that's very uh, unlike a lot of other officers, and that's a type of variability that uh, has been since incorporated into our models. OK, so this is a representation of the Nashville Police Department. Here we have 100 officers. And of those, in an average year, five will go on to have an adverse incident. And so these are these red officers here. Um, so in an ideal world, we would be able to take exactly these officers out, give them all the interventions that they need, training, counseling, et cetera. And we would send them back in, ideally preventing everything, and we'd be 100% success rate, which is great. But of course, that's not how the real world works. So if we use that threshold-based model that I described before, we would actually have to flag 66% of the department in order to catch 80% of the officers who go on to have an adverse interaction. Um, you can imagine this is not actually sustainable, either for training resources or people believing that the system does anything at all. Um, Charlotte had a model like this, and they basically stopped using it after a few years, because the officers were like, everyone gets flagged. What, what can I do? Um, our model, at the end of the summer, to identify that same 80% only flags 33% of the department. So that's a vast improvement over the current state of the art. Um, and this is something that uh, the Data Science for Social Good organization has been working on since. And the rate for Charlotte now is down to about 17% to catch that same 80%. So we are currently working to implement this both in Nashville and in Charlotte. We're working on adding new features. Um, in Charlotte, we actually have a system where supervisors can provide feedback so we can kind of get some humans in the loop. And so we say, this particular officer keeps on getting flagged. The supervisor says, no, he's totally fine. We can learn from that over time and see why is our model picking this one if they are, in fact, actually fine. Um, and also, ideally, look at how the supervisors are interacting with these scores. So some supervisors might take them very seriously, whereas others might not at all. Thank you.